Hey everyone, welcome to a special Christmas episode of The Interview. Uh, we want to extend a gracious thank you to everyone who helped uh, get our little project off the ground this year. We've done some really cool interviews and this one with Matt Brunig is our best one yet. Before we start, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, please give us a quick subscribe on our YouTube or a follow on our Spotify. We're going to have some really informative interviews coming up soon, uh, plus a lot more of the social democracy shorts type of videos because there seems to be a lot of interest in that. This is going to be a big year coming up, and I'm really glad that you're all here on this great adventure with us. I'm Sid, and this is Matt Brunig on the Build Back Better Bill. Welcome everyone to this episode of the interview by the Nordic Model. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing uh, the uh, founder of the best think tank in the game, the People's Policy Project, Mr. Matt Brunick, um, an expert on the welfare state. Uh, how are you doing today, Matt? I'm doing great. How are you guys? I'm Pretty doing good. Well. Can't Thank complain. Very much. Um, yeah, so do we just want to get the show on the road? Uh, you're a man yeah, with... Uh, you know, very constrained time. So we want to get to it as soon as possible. So one of the things that we were interested in, we were kind of brainstorming the kind of questions that we asked you. But before we get to the procedural stuff, one thing we were always kind of interested about is like, how would you outline your theory of the welfare state? As in like, what is your what is your case for its existence? Yeah, I mean, I, I approach it from uh, the perspective of thinking about how to get income to non-workers. That's the primary uh, sort of an justification for the welfare state. And if you take a step back, you know, if you think about how uh, an economy typically works, um, you have, you distribute income initially through what are called factor payments, which are payments to labor in the form of wages and salaries and payments to capital in the form of interests, rents, capital gains, dividends. And the problem with relying exclusively on those two means of of distributing income is that there's a third group of people who uh, don't really have much capital and don't work at all. And that third group of people is about half of the society at any given time. You're talking children, elderly people, disabled people, students, caregivers, and the unemployed. That's pretty much all of them. And that's about half the population. And factor payments just really can't reach them. Uh, or if they do reach them, they only reach them indirectly because they happen to live with someone who's receiving factor payments. But in that scenario, you create an equality between families that have different numbers of people who happen to be working at any given time. Um, and so I see the welfare state is basically smoothing out all of that. And the way it works is, you know, conventionally you levy a tax typically on labor, but you could do capital as well. And everyone who's working kind of chips in uh, the same amount of money or the same percentage of, of their income. They chip it into a central pot, and then that pot goes out to everyone who's not working. So children will get the child allowance. Elderly people will get the old age pension. Disabled people get the disability pension. Unemployed people get unemployment benefits. And once you've done all of that, you reduce inequality a lot. You reduce poverty a lot. Um, and you just create a much more stable system. You also help people as they transition, because obviously uh, everyone is kind of in one of those life stages at some point in their life, right? We're all born children. Most of us die elderly. Uh, many people become disabled. People lose their jobs. So, you, you know, even, even among people who aren't say, currently non-workers, you know, it, it will help them when they become non-workers. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I how I approach it. It's not, a, it's not an anti-poverty program as much as it is a pro-equality program that's focused on correcting the fact that um, the market economy has no way to get money to people who are not supplying the factors of production, which happens to be a very large group of people. So I, mean, I think, you know, maybe like a, a lib, you know, sort of like a conventional liberal response to this kind of idea of the welfare state would be that you know if, if we have if we have a fixed budget constraint like some fixed amount of money then universalism you know we're, we're sending a lot of money to you know rich people and sending a lot of money to uh um you know jeff Bezos, send jeff Bezos's kids to college or whatever um and, and so you know what what is is, is your response to, to this idea that like if we have some fixed pot of money um uh you know when, when we're creating our budget that you know, we should be targeting at this at people who are you know, in the most need, um, uh, namely you know, people who are poor, and so we should means test. Yeah, I mean, 
the the whole idea of a fixed budget uh, constraint is, I would say, just mostly confused. And it's one of those things where uh, accounting conventions and the way that we, you know, do our national accounts and the way that we score budgets and stuff like that, I think has led have led a lot of people to make a lot of uh, incorrect analysis about the you know proper way to manage the welfare state. Uh, I think a better way to look at it is to is to think about user fees versus taxes, because that's really what we're talking about when we're saying we're going to means test something. It's not that the people who are um, who have income so high that they're beyond the means test cutoff. It's not as if they they're not getting the service, right? Like they still go to college and they'll still use childcare and they still use healthcare. They still use all of those things. It's just that for them, the financing, we're forcing them to contribute user fees instead of to pay additional taxes. And the difference between those two things actually ends up being very significant. Um, because if you use taxes, you can disperse the cost across a larger group of people and you can create a more equal society up and down the ladder. So I actually had a piece recently at People's Policy Project and it was reposted at Jacobin. Jacobin, uh, that's when I pulled up the headline is universal benefits make sense, means testing doesn't. And what I do is I actually kind of tackle this question straight on and I say, okay, let's imagine that we're talking about childcare subsidies, you know, and should we provide childcare subsidies to the rich? And I say, let's imagine we say rich people is everyone who makes over 200 grand, which is a roughly the top 10% of households in the US. Well, if you look at that and you look at how many people are over that line, if you look at all rich families who are over that line, it's 12.8 million rich families. And together, they have $4.3 trillion of uh, income in the CPS. That's not like an accurate, you know, like, but that's what it is in the microdata I was using. If you look only at rich families that have kids below the age of three, instead of having 12.8 million rich families, you only have 1.1 million rich families. So if you use a user fee, what you're going to do is you're going to drop the cost of childcare, the unsubsidized child cost of childcare, you're going to drop that on those 1.1 million families, right? So in the, in the piece, I do a little math and I say, okay, let's imagine childcare is $25,000 per kid. We know that there's 1.4 million kids below the age of three who live in households that are above this income level. So, you know, put it all together and it's about 36 billion. That, that's what it would take if you were to say, okay, all those kids who are up at this level, we want you guys to pay for yourself. What we're really asking them to do is to contribute in aggregate $36 billion to the child care system, not through taxes, but through fees, right? And so I say, okay, let's take that same $36 billion. And instead of applying it as a fee only to families, rich families that have kids who are below the age of three, let's just take that fee and spread it out across all rich families. There's 12.8 million of those. There's only 1.1 million of the rich families that have kids below the age of three. When you do that, the cost of childcare per family drops from an average of 31 grand per family, because some rich families, they have two young kids in childcare. So you know, it drops from that to 2,800 per family. And as a percent of income, the, the user fee, if it was dumped only on rich families that had one point you know, the 1.1 million rich families that have kids below the, below the age of three, if you drop that whole $36 billion cost on them, that's equal to about 9.3% of their income. If you drop it on all rich families, it's equal to less than 1% of their income. And so we're not actually talking about how much money rich people are getting when we're talking about means testing versus user fees. We're talking about how we want to make the money that rich people contribute into the system, how we want to design that contribution. Do we want to design it as a user fee or do we want to design it as a tax? And I feel like the means testing debate, just people can't understand that at all because they only see the part where they go, oh, uh, we're just not giving them benefits and that saves money. It's like, well, no, what really matters is that they're contributing to the service themselves. That's the real thing is that you're financing it with user fees. It's not that they don't get the benefit. Of course, rich people use childcare. They use healthcare. They get all of that, 
consumption. It's just how is it financed? And so taxes will always be the user fee for most welfare stuff, um, if nothing else, because it spreads the cost. It creates equality between families with different numbers of kids. In this case, we're talking about child care subsidies. It also creates stability, right? Because instead of when you have a kid, your income goes way down, you just pay the small child care tax every year. And so when you have a kid, your income doesn't really change at all. Um, so yeah, I think that is a real like conceptual hurdle for a lot of people to get them to understand that, that the means testing debate is really a debate about user fees and taxes. It's not a debate about how to allocate a fixed pot of money. Um, but you know, once you can get your head around that, it's very easy to see like why this is the better approach. Hmm. I'm, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really glad that you brought up childcare because that's one of our like next questions. So recently, uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell cited your work saying that you know in year one this is relating to the childcare bill and of the better Build Back Better bill. Uh, in year one, a family that earns one dollar over state median income will be eligible for zero subsidies and on the hook for the entire unsubsidized price. Now at least thirteen thousand per year higher than before. So speaking a little bit about these welfare cliffs, could you kind of explain your main problems with this specific portion of that legislation and how does it fit into your overall critique of what liberals get wrong about uh, good and smart welfare design? Yeah, I mean, so here we have a means test that is very, very extreme. Normally these days, the way that they'll do means testing is they will phase out the benefit so that if you make an additional dollar beyond the threshold, the amount of your benefit declines by five cents or something like that. And then once you've made enough, you know, all those nickels add up and you no longer get a benefit. And it's a little smooth kind of phase out of, you know, getting the cash from the government. Here, they, they set up a hard cliff where you make $1 over the threshold and you lose all your benefits. Um, and the benefits, I mean, it's the difference between paying, you know, depend on your estimates and some of your assumptions, but it'd be the difference between paying like $1,500 towards childcare. That would be like your co-payment if you were right under the subsidy cliff line to paying the full price, which you know could be twenty thousand dollars or more, right? So one dollar, and you lose. You, you earn an extra dollar, and you lose. You know, fifteen over fifteen thousand dollars worth of benefits. That is uh, not good, just as a general matter for like incentives. It's a very uh, frustrating thing to deal with when you're talking about two earner families in particular, which of course you know that's a big uh, constituency for people who need and like to use childcare services. You run into a problem where, you know, one of them might just quit to get below the subsidy line. Um, and it's kind of goofy. You're just like sidelining some room. Like normally people will quit if they if child care is too expensive so that they can themselves take care of kids. And at least there's like a there's makes some sense. Right. You're you're exchanging your market value for now, just like doing child care. Like you're still contributing, I guess, in some sense. Um, here you, you get out of the labor market, not to do, you know, unpaid childcare work and save on your childcare bills, but you get out of the labor market just so the kid can go in the center and then you're not doing anything. I mean, it's a, it's a really goofy design. Um, and the point he is making, and I mean, we're just repeating the point I'm making is that we actually have an interesting interaction of two features of this program. The first feature is the subsidy cliff where you make the $1 and you lose everything. And the second feature is that the unsubsidized price of childcare is actually gonna go up. So it would be one thing if you were just like, hey, everyone over this income threshold, you don't get any benefit. And you know that would cause a lot of frustrations and a lot of these little problems around the edges, especially people who had income right around the line and all that kind of stuff. But at least you could look at it and say, hey, all else equal, yeah, you're not getting any benefit, but you're no worse off than you were before. You know, you're, we're just not helping you, but you, we weren't helping you before, so it's all good. Here, when you increase the unsubsidized price, you, you are actually hurting them, like you're cutting them back from, from the situation they had prior to the passage of the bill. Uh, and the reason it increases the unsubsidized price, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. One, which, and this is the more relevant reason in the initial years, is you're just going to have a massive increase in demand for child care services uh, under this legislation. Like the bottom half of kids essentially can now go to child care for free. This is a population that currently uses very little child care because it's so expensive, especially formal child care. 
Um, and so you're, you're uncapping them. Now you've got this massive new base of users. You've got to build up a capacity to absorb them, which means you've got to go out and hire a bunch of people. You've got to hire them away from other jobs, right? We have a tight labor market. You can't continue to pay childcare wages, which is basically the lowest wage in our society. You can't pay, continue to pay childcare wages and, and, and still attract that many more people into the sector to be able to provide services to all these new subsidized users. So you're going to have to up the wage. You up the wage, that ups the cost, that ups the price. And now the unsubsidized price is higher and people who are over the threshold pay more. And like, it's really, you know, I point this out sometimes and I don't know, people kind of have various reactions to it. I think one of, sometimes people will have the kind of like, oh, boo-hoo, yeah, we're, we're hurting these people. And I mean, my, my point on that is really just like, it's not necessary to increase anyone's price. Like you can just make sure everyone's covered by the subsidies. And they do that for the pre-K bill, right? So the child care is ages zero to two, the pre-K part of the bill is ages three and four. For pre-K, there are problems with the bill, but there's not problems with the subsidy design because the subsidy design is just, it's free. It's like kindergarten, but now for ages three and four. That's like the parental experience of it if it actually gets implemented. Um, so you could just do that for lower down. Like there's lots of things you could do to fix the problem. Um, and they just, they haven't gone that way with it, so... With that. And before we move on to the next question, I just want to just a point that I, I'm always interested about. And I think that we should do a better job of explaining as the kind of, you know, policy based leftists that we are. You were talking earlier about the kind of phase out structure uh, in means testing. And, you know, um, do you think it's like best to describe it as like kind of a tax on people as they move up that kind of income ladder, they're losing out on the transfer income and that should really be seen as a kind of tax? And how do we do a better job of kind of explaining this to people? Yeah, yeah, it is a tax. It functions uh, exactly like a tax. And I mean, as, as a, you know, it, this kind of goes back to the user fee question. With cash, it's, it's a little bit different because um, you can't think of a user fee because, <laughs> you know, it's just sending money out to people. But it's best, you know, really to conceive of it as a revenue raiser, right? Is to start in your mind. Like the child allowance is a good example of this. And there was actually a recent paper published by, uh, the Norwegian statistical agency about the U.S. child allowance, such as we have now, the child tax credit that we've had for this last year. Um, and, you know, it phases out. It actually starts phasing out around like 115K, and then it stops, and then it phases out again at 200K. It's, it's a very complicated kind of structure. But at those phase-out zones, like I said before, you earn an extra dollar, and they take five cents of your CTC away from you. That's the same thing as, a, as having a 5% marginal tax rate in that area. And you can do the math to just say, okay, how much money does that raise? Like, let, like let's say we didn't have that at all and we just gave out the $300 a month to everyone. What if we did that and then relative to that, we added this phase in? How much money does that save? And really, we should think about that as we're, we're saving money by raising taxes on these people, because we are, we're applying an effective marginal tax rate of 5% in order to, right? It's a revenue raiser. And when you start thinking about it that way, then, then it becomes easier to ask the question, well, is that the best way to raise revenue? Like we do need to raise revenue, of course, if we're going to provide the benefit, but is that the best way to do it? Or is there maybe a better way to do it? And the, the paper I was talking about that the Norwegian statistical agency put out that's exactly the question that they answered or, or tried to answer. They said, well, <laughs> the abstract of the paper was very funny. They were like, we, uh, you know, we asked the Americans, you know, maybe consider a universal child benefit. Um, but what they do is they model it exactly like that. They say, hey, we could take this phase out and we can figure out exactly how much money it raises. And then we could figure out how you could raise that same amount of money by instead of phasing out the benefit, just providing a universal benefit and then applying a tax, you know, a normal tax somewhere else. And they find that what's kind of clever about the paper is they, because parental labor supply is more sensitive to tax rates than non-parental labor supply, when you use a tax, the tax applies to all tax units. A means test only applies to tax units with children because, you know, you have to be receiving the benefit to be subjected to the means test. So by swapping out the means test with a tax, one, you get to lower the tax rate because you're taxing all units. You're not just taxing units with kids. So you got a bigger base. So you get to lower the rate and you're shifting some of that burden onto tax units without kids. 
and away from tax units with kids, you know, relative to the means test. And since tax units with kids have more sensitivity to tax rates when it comes to labor supply, you actually increase total work. You know, so from a pure like I'm trying to maximize work effort kind of thing, you would prefer the universal tax funded uh, benefit. Mm-hmm. And and it's funny because you know most of the time someone would say, well, no, because if you do it universal, then it's more expensive and you have to raise taxes. Right. And taxes, of course, discourage work. And they're like, well, no, the rev- the means test is the tax in your system. We this So it's really one tax versus another tax. And actually, this tax is more efficient. So that's just on like the narrow distributive question. The other thing with universality versus means testing, it has to do with administration. Universal benefits much easier to administer. You send out a check to every kid. You don't have to peek to see, you know, uh, are their parents married? <laughs> um, you don't have to peek to see what their income is or what their income was last year or try to predict it this year. You don't have to, you're right, all these factors that go in to a means test, you just don't have to do it. You send the check out. And so when people are interacting with the benefit side of the system, that becomes a lot easier. And that's especially important for poorer people because they tend to have a harder time accessing benefit systems. If you make them simpler than more of them will access it. You'll have higher participation rates and you'll actually achieve the thing you're trying to achieve, which is to help poor people. You know, like the means test is meant, you know, in some ways, although misguidedly to say, we're going to target the aid to the poor, but then the things you have to do administratively to carry out that targeting uh, creates paperwork burdens that a lot of poor people struggle to uh, navigate. So even in like the wonkiest, narrowest, like talk about tax rates and distribution. Isn't this better? Doesn't it save money? Even in that narrow frame, it's just not true. That means testing is better than universal benefits. And then at the second you move beyond that and you, and you start talking about, let's talk about the practical realities of administering this complicated stuff. And let's talk about you know the political realities of how people feel when they have to go through these hoops and and, you know, their attitudes towards government and all that kind of stuff, then, I mean, the case just, it becomes overwhelming, I think. You know, perhaps like, you know, aside from uh, uh, means testing, maybe the, the second great sin uh, in, in the American uh, welfare states is, is cost sharing with states, which is something that, that you, you, know, you broke a story today about how the CBO is, you know, uh, accounting for the fact that, um, you know, kids in red states uh, won't get, uh, you know, the childcare and pre-K um, because because the Republican governors there, you know, won't take up the the federal government's uh, cost-sharing offer. Um, and so I wanted to to, to talk, uh, you know, a, a little bit about about this because one thing that, that that seems to me to be like, I don't know, really frustrating about watching the you know this kind of congressional uh, um, discourse play out is 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 that you know it, it doesn't it, it it seems very unlikely to me that someone like Manchin, you know, really has like a well-reasoned, you know, amount of, of uh, you know, uh, government spending that he's okay with, that he's arrived through, through some like, you know, logical, rational project. It seems to be mainly down to, you know, kind of vibes in some sense. And so, you know, I, I wondered whether you had an idea of, you know, a, a better way that, that we should be talking about you know, the, the budgetary impact of these things. You've alluded to this already a little bit, you know, in terms of talking about means testing market tax and these sorts of things. Um, but is there a better way to talk about like the budgetary impact of, of these congressional bills that isn't, you know, uh, the, the amount of money over, te- over this arbitrary 10 year window um, that, that would kind of avoid some of these games that get played? Um, I mean, as far as talking about them, certainly, you know, I mean, you can use instead of raw dollar values, you could use percentage of GDP. Uh, I think this bill is going to be less than 1% of GDP. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's not like the amount of money involved is not actually all that significant. Um, but yeah, I mean, the problem with the reason why these things get talked this way and, and kind of get structured all this way, it has, it has everything to do with the, the rules and the processes of passing budgets and especially reconciliation budgets. Uh, you have to pass a resolution and the resolution has certain dollar amounts and the, there's a whole kind of thing involved. And so it seems like most of the talk is kind of downstream of that, though I don't know that everyone who talks that way realizes that like, oh, you're talking, the reason people talk this way is for like certain technical Senate reasons that don't necessarily apply to you if you're just like a newspaper writer. So maybe 
try to talk about it differently. Um, but, but that's mostly, you know, that's how they do all this stuff is just, we got this 10 year window and the dollar amounts have to be below a certain amount in these windows based on the resolution that was passed. And so, you know, let the games begin, <laughs> shift some of the costs on the states and now boom, it's off your budget. And so you can get below your dollar figure, uh, shift some of the costs onto users. Oh, now even better. Do a little means test. Oh, well, means test. We can do a means test that saves money. We couldn't do a tax because then, then now you're raising taxes, um, which is, you know, against certain pledges you've made. So now let's start larding it up with means tests which even though they are functionally taxes, they're technically not taxes. And so we're technically not breaking promises. And let's have the programs, uh, let's delay when they start. Let's have it so it doesn't start for like three years just to kind of push the program back in the window. Let's uh, sunset it after five years. So it just like stops in the middle of the window and the program just ceases to exist on paper. You know, let's do all that stuff. Um, and then we'll hit this dollar figure and it's all very stupid and it's like no government should ever run that way. And like you said, uh, it's kind of weird that the reason you try to do all that gimmicks, those gimmicks is ostensibly because you have someone like Joe Manchin who's saying he's not comfortable with spending over a certain amount. But these gimmicks, they kind of hide the spending. They don't actually reduce it. Um, they just kind of take it off based on the way things are, are counted. It kind of takes it off the bill. And but if you have someone who's genuinely interested in that, those kinds of games are not going to probably impress them. And there was actually a Joe Manchin quote that was being circulated yesterday or maybe two days ago, where he actually said exactly this. He, you know, he's like, these programs, they last for like six years and they disappear. Like that, that's just unserious to me. You know, I had a I wanted you guys to shrink down the bill, not, you know, pretend to shrink it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the other thing uh, that some people have responded to, um, you know, when, when it's brought up that, uh, you know, the, the, the pre-K will be cost shared, that it actually won't be that much of an issue because um, there's, kind, you know, there's kind of like a, a you know, a, a backstop in the bill where they say, you know, if, if the states won't do it, then, then, you know, we can give the funding to like municipalities and, and uh, or like Head Start programs and these sorts of things. Do you, do you have a sense of how, you know, how impactful that'll be in terms of, um, uh, uh, I don't know, addressing the concerns about cost sharing? Yeah, so I mean, what you're talking about is um, for both the child care and the pre-K bills, the way it actually works, although this is not how it's discussed kind of in common languages, the federal government's not actually giving anyone any child care or any pre-K. They, what they do is they set aside some money and it, the money is meant to incentivize states to set up pre-K systems and child care systems that are consistent with the rules laid out in the bill. Because if you do that, you get some of the money. So it's, uh, it's, mon it's monetary incentives for states to do it. And the monetary incentives, they, they don't actually cover the full cost of these programs. For pre-K, I think it's less than half. It's hard to say exactly. Um, without you know a crystal ball, but I think it's a little bit less than half. So a state that wanted to kind of play along and create a pre-K system, they would have to create this big system and then the feds would only cover half the cost. So now the state's got to pick up the other half. And so now they got to go tax. That's not always easy. And especially in red states, they don't want to. So, you know, a lot of states are just going to say either because the cost sharing is inadequate or because the program expires after six years or for ideological reasons, they're just going to say, I'm not participating too bad. The program is not going to be implemented in my state. And then as you pointed out, what some of the advocates will do at that point, when you point out, hey, there's a big problem with participation, they'll come back and they'll say, no, we've, we've actually solved this problem because uh, we set aside money for localities, for, for municipalities. You know, so if your state doesn't participate, maybe your city could participate and then you could get money. Now, the problem with this is that the amount of money that they've actually set aside for localities is a joke. Um, so for childcare, 
the amount of money they set aside for localities is $950 million per year for the whole country. Less than a billion. And for pre-K, for pre-K, it's $1.9 billion. You know, I actually did a spreadsheet on this. I haven't published this yet. I don't know if I will. So maybe it'll be an exclusive for you. Um, I went through all of the counties that voted for Biden in the non-Medicaid expansion states. Of course, all the non-Medicaid expansion states, those were Trump states, but you have got blue counties in those states, right? Um, and so let's go through the blue counties and see how that all works. Um, and what I found was, if you go through those states and you look at their population um, of kids that would be eligible for this stuff, it's right about 3 million kids. So there are 12 states that haven't expanded Medicaid. So I just go to those 12 states, get all the blue counties in those 12 states, and I add up all the kids in those counties who are below the age of, of five. You get 3 million kids. Okay, so we take the, you know, the, the funding, the, you know, the child care locality funding and the pre-K locality funding, we add it together, we divide it by the number of kids, and you get $935 per kid in the blue county. For, for the, so if, like, if all the blue counties in those states were like, we're going to get involved now, the feds have, have got less than $1,000 per kid for them. And mm -hmm. that's just, that's not enough to fund a child care or pre-K spot, nowhere near enough. Um, so that funding is a joke. And what's weird is it almost seems like they put that in there just so they could say that. And they, like, maybe you wouldn't check it, you know, like they, which means that they're aware, they're aware of the problem that states won't participate. They conceive of partially a solution, which is let's go around them. And then they don't fund it. And, and, and all they really do is when you bring it up, they point to it and I guess, hope you don't go read it and realize how inadequate the money actually is for the locality funding. Um, that seems like that's been my experience with it. Cause when you then confront them, when you're like, wait, 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 you think this is going to cover uh, this amount of money, a uh, 950 million a year, uh, the, the Dallas independent school district's budget is, oh, is over a billion a year. This is less than the, the budget of, of a one school district in one of the cities in one of the <laughs> states. And then, and then crickets. I don't really have an answer for that. So, do you, do you have another question, Chad, or should I move on to the next one? Okay. Yeah. So, another portion of the Build Back Better bill is the paid leave plan. So, America is one of the only countries in the world with no paid leave for parents. Democrats have recently proposed adding paid family leave into their Build Back Better bill. Could you run through some of your main criticisms, criticisms with this? Because you've called this House paid leave proposal downright awful. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I haven't thought about paid leave in a while. Uh, they took it out of the bill at one point and then they added it back in. And uh, my understanding is that Joe Manchin, like, it's just a no-go with Joe. So I've kind of just decided to stop spending so much time on it. But it is illuminating it to see kind of how they got here, just from like a policy matter. Like, what did these guys actually put up? This is a thing that Democrats have been talking about uh, since the 90s. I mean, pro I mean, even before then, but like the current incarnation of this movement for paid leave and all the people in it and all the stuff they've been writing and the bills they've been putting out, you know, that's since the 90s. So we're talking 30 years on, you got 30 years to prepare for this moment. Here's your window. Maybe you can slide it in. And what we get as it currently stands is a four week benefit for paid family and medical leave. To be eligible for it, you have to have worked a certain amount in the prior like five or six months, um, and you have to have earned a certain amount of money in the prior two years. Those two eligibility rules, which are uh, work history rules, are going to exclude about one in three new mothers right off the bat um, because they are giving birth before they join the labor force. They might still be in high school or college. They might have, uh, they might be disabled. They might have had a long spell of unemployment. They might be a stay at home parent. Maybe they have a young child in the house and they're caring for them and they've decided to, to have a second. Um, they don't get any benefit from this, which is unlike other countries. In other countries, these are fully universal benefits. If you, if you get, if you have a kid, you get at least something, you get some minimum benefit. Um, so right off the bat, they exclude about a third of new, uh, new mothers. 
And then instead of creating a simple federal program similar to Social Security, where you know you get above a certain age, you go to the Social Security Administration, they check you out, start sending you checks. Or if you become disabled, you go to the Social Security office, they you know <laughs> take you to the disability determination uh, services, make sure you're, it all checks out, and they start sending you a check. Instead of that, they're essentially inviting employers to create these private paid leave insurance plans. And every year, these plans are basically going to like have to send a list to the treasury of all the people who are covered under their plan. So like the treasury is going to be constantly building this database that tries to make sure it knows exactly who has what insurance from what employer. Um, it does this only annually, though. And as we know, many workers change jobs within a given year. So the database is out of date the second it's created. And the second it's updated, it's out of date again. Um, and we're going to be doing that. And instead of having like a federal program, a fully federal program, what's going to happen is the federal government's going to give money to employers so that those employers can buy private paid leave insurance. And it's an, a tremendous waste of money. Uh, it's going to create a tremendous hassle um, and this extremely complicated. It's basically a giveaway to this industry. Uh, Richard Neal, who's the head of the Ways and Means Committee, he is one of the top uh, recipients of money from the life insurance industry. But perhaps more importantly than that, uh, there's a major insurance company that uh, does, um, there's a major insurance company that does this kind of stuff. I forget what it's called. I think it might be called Mass Health. That uh, is uh, located in his uh, district. Um, so he seems to have kind of come in at the end and was like, "We need to get, we need to wet the beak of the insurance industry." They give me a lot of money and they employ a lot of people in my district, and and so now the program kind of sucks and is complicated. Um, there's a lot of other problems as well. I actually don't remember all of them off the top of my head because, uh, like I said, uh. I don't know, about a month or so, maybe two months or so ago, I, it, it seemed pretty definitive that it was not going to survive the Senate. So I kind of just checked out. I suppose, I guess it fits into kind of the, the broader question uh, is that, you know, we have a set of great policies that we want to implement, but we have that a set of policies that are possible given the kind of U.S. institutions that exist. Uh, but to kind of get better policies, we need to improve these institutions, but we can't improve these institutions without having better policy. Like, how do you, like, how do you think we should break out of this like insidious cycle of never being able to get a better welfare state because we keep piecing together these terrible programs? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's tremendously difficult. I mean, there was a push for a while. I, you know, once Joe came in and uh, Joe Manchin came in and said, hey, we need to cut the size of this. There was a decision that you could have made at that point, which was to say, you know, let's do fewer programs, but like, let's make them good. So like, let's just focus on getting free pre-K to everyone. Like, yeah, it sucks, you know, to leave the child care part out, but let's just put all the money in the pre-K thing, make sure it's just just great and wonderful and everyone loves it. And then maybe we could come back later and say, Hey, you like that? Why not go down to age two and age one, you know? Uh, but, uh, and we could have done that with other things, right? Essentially prioritized a few things and put a bunch of money into it and make sure it was done really, really well. And instead they've chosen to do a bunch of things in a very half-assed way. And like you said, I, I, I mean, I don't want to get too speculative about how, how this all ultimately washes out in elections and stuff like that. But it seems at least plausible that you create programs that aren't very good and that kind of degrades the constituency for building more. Like if you read some of the at least theories of, and even the historical timelines of uh, the welfare states that were created in the Nordic countries, they weren't all created overnight. They'd add, you know, one benefit and then another benefit and then another benefit. And there seemed to be a kind of momentum to that, right? Like if you, if you promise, hey, we're going to provide a really cool, great paid leave benefit, and then you go out and you do it and you deliver and everyone benefits from it, it becomes very easy from that point to go back to them and say, hey, you know how we did this? Yeah, we can do this other thing too. And you're credible because people have seen it. Um, I think you lose credibility when you when you don't do that. 
And I don't know, it's very tough. And I mean, another element of this is you'd like to say, well, hey, let's vote. Like there are members of Congress who have really, who are, you know, very serious about designing things this way, right? The more left-wing members of Congress, whether that's the squad or Bowman or uh, obviously Sanders, um, you have these members who are serious about this, but they're a minority of the Democratic Party. And you could kind of say, well, let's elect more of them and sure, sure, sure. But the basic problem is that when push comes to shove, as we're kind of building towards more left success and elections, what will happen is we'll have some kind of successful election period where there's enough Democrats in Congress that they can now pass stuff. But it's not, but you're still going to have like a bunch of moderates, you know, uh, in the caucus. And so you get all these voters geared up and excited to like, let's get some of these lefties in here and maybe they could do like a universal program or something. But in practice, the electoral success results in them having to get something through with these more moderate members and it kind of sucks. And, and that just seems very demobilizing, you know? Um, and I don't know how you get over that hump. How do you, you know, because it seems like you build, 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 build. Now you have a nice little like slim majority, but the slim majority includes people who have these really bad opinions about how to build a welfare state, but you're desperate to get something done and then you get something done and it kind of sucks. And now you have to, you know, people go, well, I don't know if I like that. It kind of sucks. And you're like, no, yeah, it does suck. But like, if you, I could do it better. Like it's, it's, it's not, it's not just that government programs suck. It's that one sucks. And, but then it's like, well, I, you know, I don't know. I elected you and you didn't do it. And I could elect you again. And what are you going to do again? You're going to go back with those same members and try to get something through. I, I think it's very tough. I, I don't know how to solve that political problem. Um, now with the multi-party system, that seems to help to some degree, maybe, because mm -hmm. you can distinguish yourself like as a coalition and say, hey, we're the left party. We stand for this, you know, <laughs> like build our ranks. And, and to the extent that we enter into government with other parties, we do so with specific demands, you know? And so maybe we can protect a very specific thing that we want to do and say, hey, this is what we want to do and we want it done this way. And that'll be the price of our member of our joining the coalition. And then we can kind of go and build off of that as it is without the ability to do that because we don't have multi-party system everything gets mixed together and you know you don't have that kind of horse trading that mm. occurs between from party to party is all just done internally and everything gets watered down and i don't know it it, it doesn't seem to we don't ever seem to get anything we don't even get a perfect program through. <laughs> like yeah. Just give me one perfect program. It could be in a small, even on like a small topic, but just like give me one perfect one, you know, and we don't ever get there. Absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I suppose we are kind of stuck. I mean, yeah, it is kind of a frustrating cycle, right? And I think you, you view this, you, you can see this cycle play out in how, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, I've seen interviews with like people in Sweden and how they view, you know, you ask them like, hey, taxes are really high. How do you feel about that? Right. Like that it, taxes aren't viewed the same way as they're viewed here. They're viewed as like, yeah, we're contributing, you know, to this pot that everyone takes from and these sorts of things. Whereas is, is here, you know, taxes are, are, are an incredibly dirty word. And I think that speaks to, you know, they're in the good cycle of like high social trust you know, leads to, you know, being okay with paying high taxes, leads to good programs and these sorts of things. And we're stuck in the, in the sort of bad cycle. And, and I, so I guess, you know, I, what I sort of wonder is, is, is moving, you know, kind of beyond the welfare state, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't know how, you know, how we get to this point, given that it's, it's even difficult to design good welfare programs or not to design them, but to get them through. Um, you know, what's kind of your vision? You know, you describe yourself as a socialist. What's kind of your, your longer term vision for, uh, um, you know, how you want to transform the economy, you know, you know, in the United States, um, you know, in addition to providing a, a, you know, universal social democratic welfare state? Well, in terms of the structure of the economy, you know, the welfare state is one prong. Then you have organized labor is the second prong. Um, 
you know, sectoral unions would be ideal, but any kind of increase in union dis density, especially if you can get up like reasonably high, um, you know, that's good. That can create a more equal distribution of wages as well as worker protection and gives worker more control over the economy and over certain decisions that are made in it. On the corporate side, on the, on the business side, uh, promote public ownership. Um, I tend to think that that's you know, the way to sort of handle that because if you don't do public ownership of, of enterprises, at least a lot of them, as much as you, you plausibly can through things like state-owned enterprises or social wealth funds, if you don't do that, then what ends up happening is most of the businesses and enterprises and the capital stock of the society ends up owned by a relatively small group of people. They have a lot of power. It's very difficult. Um, you know, they, ha they have a lot of credible threats that they can make, you know, against you. Um, and so it's important to, to try to own things publicly and organize the labor market uh, collectively through uh, these unions and then provide the welfare state for non-workers, um, which also helps workers in the ways we've already discussed before. Um, that's kind of the overall vision. Now, I mean, the mechanics of getting there, I, I don't really know. You know, when I, I the way I was, I approached it coming out of college and then law school, I mean, I went to law school to become a labor lawyer. I was going to work in the union movement. And I did, I got a job at the NLRB. I worked there for a year and a half and I was, you know, I was prepared to do that for 40 years, you know, and just kind of keep my head down and do what I can there to try to help the, the labor movement, um, you know, see where it goes, because that seems to be a pretty crucial part of the puzzle. It's a part of the puzzle that doesn't necessarily require elections, and it gives you direct power, right? Workers have direct power over things because they can strike and they can do other things that disrupt production, which gives you direct power as opposed to kind of representative power that you get through government. So that was sort of my mentality at the time. That didn't work out for, for uh, political reasons. I ended up uh, uh, terminated from that job uh, due to posting, basically. And um, now I just post full time, I guess. Uh, you know, I mean, I, sh I shifted to just, OK, well, I'll just write about policy and focus on that angle of it. Um, not to say that that other approach was was is paying dividends either. You know, the union movement is in a perpetual decline in the in the U.S. Um, but there was some thought in my mind that at least, you know, you could kind of plug away every day and contribute sort of materially every day. Whereas writing this policy and stuff, like there are things you can point to like, oh, wow, I, I influenced the Senate majority leader or, oh, Bernie, you know, added one of my policies to his platform or, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the Wall Street Journal today. Like there's these kind of things that the think tank people collect. And if I had more conventional donors, I would like have a more comprehensive database of them so I could show them and explain to them why they need to keep giving me money um, if I had. But but that's just that's not real. <laughs> these are sort of phantoms of like um, possible, like maybe I'm steering the conversation to some degree. And then maybe that steering of the conversation will eventually result in something. Um, I don't know. It's very abstract, much more abstract than like doing union movement work every day. So, well, I can tell you at least that the, the, the two of us certainly appreciate the, the, the stuff that you write. Um, so, you know, I guess that's what, that, that's what's uh, a one good thing that came out of this approach. Um, I, I just wonder, you know, we're running kind of, you know, close to time. And so, as just kind of like a final summing up question, um, you know, if you could, if you could like Matt Brunig pill. Uh, um, you know, everyone in America or, or, you know, policy type people of like one thing, if you convince them of one thing that you believe that, that or one way of seeing things that, 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 that uh, if you could, if you get them to see things the way that you do on one, you know, kind of specific issue, um, what would that be? Like, like, what, what would you kind of like beam into, you know, the brains of, of every uh, human in America? Oh, that's a tough one. Also to know like what constitutes a single thing as opposed to, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, what I focused on in my writing in particular from the get-go was 
Yeah, maybe it, maybe this is an easy thing. It's just to talk about the the way in which one, you know, economic outcomes are the result of policy choices or the result of the way you construct the economy, right? The economy is a, is a, is a creature of policy. It's it's not a invisible hand. It's not a a uh, thing that just kind of exists organically or whatever. It's it's a fully kind of plan, at least the framework of it is fully planned by governments, you know, whether they're creating corporate laws or bankruptcy laws or securities laws or property laws, all that kind of creates the framework for the system taxes, everything. Um, and, you know, the, the, you can, you know, design those things a variety of different ways. And the way you design them really has a massive impact on on things like poverty and inequality and financial stability and all the rest of it. So it's important never to like naturalize your bad outcomes and think like, oh, that's because, uh, you know, this and this. Oh, well, yeah, of course he lost his house because he lost his job or, oh, yeah, yeah, he's struggling. He has a medical problem or something it's like all of that is a choice. You know, could create your system so that those those things didn't happen as a result of those causes. Um and then from there, you know, it's just if you can get people over that hump, then it's like, OK, well, you know, show me other instances, show me other ways of going. Right. Because if you say there's different ways to design it and other ways you could design it, these problems that I view as just kind of natural outcomes of bad luck or bad merit or whatever, that, th that those could be reversed. Um, you know, then what are the other ways of doing it? And that, I think, is where the Nordic model comes in. That's that. That was my initial, like, you know, if I was when I was writing on mapbring.com and you know, 2011 or 2012, before I was, I was still in school. I didn't ever have a job, or anything like that. That was kind of the big thing that stood out to me because I was trying to sort of solve these problems and like the, the, you know, getting over that hump and understanding the, I guess, like, social constructiveness of it all, the economy in particular. Um, if you can get there. I think it's a very short step from there to being like, okay, so who's constructed it the best? And then off into the Nordic model. Well, thank you for the, the you know, ringing endorsement of, of the Nordic model there at the end. You know, I know not necessarily the podcast that you're on, but we'll, we'll clip that out of context and uh, uh, use that as, as an endorsement for us. Um, <laughs> in either case, uh, uh, thank you so much for, for, for being on. Once again, uh, this was... Matt Brunick uh, on the interview by the Nordic Model. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolute pleasure having you.